What is going down? Welcome to Respect the Chain. Right now, we're with the man. If you're traveling, if you want to know where to eat, he has been all over television, all over our lives for over 10 years. If you're going to Hawaii, if you're going to New York, if you're going to Florida, you see where Adam Richmond is going to eat, and that's where you visit. We're here with Adam. Adam, you have a new show. Adam Meets the 80s. Thank you so much for being here. How are you today? My honor. Thanks for having me, brother. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. So we're very excited about the show. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the show? In Adam Meets the 80s, we retrace the path and the sort of journey of these foods that either were created in the 80s and went on to become national and global icons, but also we kind of do a little bit of investigation and find the foods that existed in the 80s and kind of didn't make it. So we try to resurrect and rediscover and recreate some of the flavors and the foods that disappeared. Plus, we get a chance to explore the commercials, the jingles, the slogans. Um, we even have a whole segment where we go through like the old school commercials and the infomercials. So I do the Ginsu knife commercial, <laughs> the, the juicer juice man, and we actually try it. Like I grew up watching these things. So like I'm cutting through the can and then trying to cut through the tomato. Um, <laughs> but I think that the thing is I wanted to make something that like, yeah, sure. I'm a kid of the eighties. So this has a special place in my heart, but I also wanted to create something for people who didn't grow up in the eighties. So if you just want delicious food and cool things to try, we got you. If you want nostalgia, we got you. If you want a little bit of the facts and the history of why the foods in the 80s were in the 80s or how they were created, we got you. I mean, I saw the first episode and it's unbelievable. Uh -huh. Domino's, they had, the, they had two different breakfast pizzas. The cream cheese pizza is what really, uh, really got me. Yeah, that was, it was like a, I mean, I know that we're both members of the tribe here. Eight more will have a minion. But it, it was vaguely like a blitz because it was blueberry and streusel and cream cheese. But the thing that they don't tell you is that cream cheese after coming out of a pizza oven is like like the blood from Alien, like it could melt through the hull of a ship. And so we all took a bite and we all had to stop filming till our mouths recovered. Because, so should we um, stick to the cold cream cheese or the warm cream cheese? What do you, what do you, you think? You know, I, 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 like the, I like the bagel to provide its own warmth. <laughs> but the savory, the savory breakfast pizza was superb. Like truly, truly superb. It existed for six months in 1985, never existed again. And it was just because it was a logistic nightmare for, for Domino's to continue to make it. But, you know, you see that, like, on someone's face, this brand they know, this meal they love, coming together in a way they never knew existed, and they never knew it happened in their own backyard, in their own country in the 80s. Well, that's what's so exciting about the show, because there's different menu items now, and it's a lot of fun to go back in the day of the 80s. And you're like, I never knew they made this breakfast pizza. And I have a feeling, based off this show, they're probably going to bring a lot of these items back. I think so, too. I was interested also with Auntie Anne's. I mean, that's an amazing story. And I love that there's a secret dunk that they do, and that's what gives Auntie Anne's the flavor. It's Yeah, that's the strangest thing to me. And my friend makes pretzels at home, and he said, you know, he had to go to Germany and take a class because he says it's deceptively difficult. And yeah, there's a solution that they dunk it in and it kind of creates a chemical process that brings the flavor out without it. Dude, it's like eating like a styrofoam cup. It's like eating the old school McDLT <laughs> container. But that's the other thing too, right? Like I have a mom and a stepmom that are both successful career women and, um, in the 80s, that was the exception and not the norm. And here was this lady who had a farmer's market stand, tried to get into this new 80s phenomenon of the mall. The mall manager is like, dude, you're selling pretzels in Pennsylvania? Please get out of here. She, she argues with him, argues with him. He says, fine, I'll give you this little stand by the parking lot, thinking that not even in the food court, no one's going to want this. But then the smell goes so crazy. Everyone's walked by an Aunt Dan's, you know the vibes. And so the smell makes it so crazy, she explodes and he ends up buying a franchise. After watching the show today, I'm in New York City. I was in Times yeah. Square and I got very excited. I saw an Auntie Anne's and I was like, oh, I got to get a pretzel now. And they, they weren't open, unfortunately. It was, it was very upsetting. <laughs> I'm like, it's but 10 a.m. Really, it's time. But like, that's it, too. Like, for me, I've walked past Cinnabons and Auntie Anne's and Pizza Hut's and Domino's my whole life. 
And then all of a sudden you have this very new appreciation of what they've done. I mean, uh, to me, you know, there was a father and son team that created Cinnabon to find out how they source their cinnamon and how hard it was to find the right kind and where they got their inspiration. I mean, for me, what killed me was finding out from Cinnabon that they do different versions of Cinnabons for different countries. Oh, really? So in Mexico, there's like a Dulce de Leche uh, or like a Tres Leches Cinnabon. There's like a maple cherry blossom variant in Japan. Like, wh why don't we, we need that. them, dude? We like, need that. They're so good. They made me one of the French ones, this like chocolate Cinnabon thing. It was, I mean, you need to like eat it with a shot of insulin. It's so sweet, but it's so freaking delicious. The other thing that I think was actually really cool was getting to sample flavors that you can't get anymore, like Keebler Magic Middle Cookies. And we went to um, the, a food lab in Madison, Wisconsin, and they were able to recreate Magic Middles. And then I found out afterwards that there is such a devout following for people who miss those cookies that there's a Facebook group with over 3,000 people campaigning wow. Keebler to bring Magic Middles back. Wow. People are very passionate about the food they grew up with because, you know, like you said, it's nostalgic. It brings back the memories from your childhood. It makes you feel good. You feel like a kid again. So, you know, food mm -hmm. really brings people's emotions. Absolutely. And it's not even, I realized it was also the packaging. For example, we went to a vintage soda collector and I opened an old can of soda and it had the old rip top can where not where like on like this can of soda, you, yeah. you pull the tab and then you pull it back and it stays there. But the old one, you pull it completely off and then you'd have this ring that you could propose to your third grade girlfriend, which I may or may not have done. <laughs> but like you have you have this ring on it. So just that sensation back in the day, soda bottles were glass and they had labels made of styrofoam and you used to sort of peel it as like a nervous habit. All those feelings, all those tactile sensations are equally lost. And that's part of the food experience, but it was also like, oh my God, like I remember that. I remember that feeling when we opened a can of planters cheese balls from the eighties, which smelled like a man's locker room, but still <laughs> like it was, it was tough. Like I was like, yeah, cheese balls. That's exactly what it smells like. <laughs> that's what I want right now. Old cheese balls, old cheese. Exactly. Balls. The, the worst, the worst thing I had eaten uh, in the course of the show, I'll fully cop to it. One of them, at least um, I tried a star Wars cookie from 1983 uh yes the pepperidge farm we opened it and i uh was it was yum kippur so i had been fasting and the yeah, first you broke thing the i ate fast with the star wars cookie from yeah, 14 year old star wars cookie <laughs> what a shonda and the thing is i'm eating it and, you know we had the whole it's a, a brilliant place called rancho obi-wan and it's the world's largest star wars collection guinness book recognized and we're sitting there drinking the blue milk doing the whole star wars meal and we open it, and I I take one bite of Darth Vader's head, and um, <laughs> my stomach audibly makes like a like a Chewbacca noise. <laughs> and my cameraman actually had to put the camera on a tripod because he was laughing too much. We have the footage. And uh, the funniest thing was, I go, "Oh well, nothing like some rancid oil." He goes, "No, there's no oil." He goes, "Oh, wait a minute." There's butter and eggs. I'm like, yep, 41 year old eggs. Smartest <laughs> choice ever. You know, you're going to a lot of chain restaurants, which I love. I mean, again, the chain restaurants, they have such a following. People love them. It's like no matter where you go in the world, you know you go to a chain, it's going to taste the same. You, that's why you go there. You look for that comfort. Um, I'm very interested. I know you also went to Panda Express in one of your episodes. Yes, um, the first about? Panda Express. First that was amazing. I have to say I was blown away. Blown, truly blown away by the story of the family. People forget because they see Panda Express everywhere. They're all still family owned. Every single one of them is still family owned. That's but on top of that, to think they invented orange chicken. Not even that. A man named Andy Cow invented orange chicken in the 1980s. And I got to film with him. And to for me, I just always, I grew up assuming... This is a traditional Chinese dish. Excuse me. This has been around 
for eons, you know, since the Ming dynasty, they've been eating orange chicken. I didn't know it was created in the eighties, let alone by this man. And on camera, he makes me three of the tens of different iterations he made. But that's the thing that's so cool. Orange chicken is a mainstay in what we call like Americanized Chinese food. But it all started from one family who had a restaurant in Burbank called the Panda Inn. One of their customers was the proprietor of the Glendale Galleria. And he said, you know, hey, there's this new concept called the shopping mall. Would you guys like to do, you know, something that are like Chinese food in like a big building with stores? That sounds crazy. He's like, but you can't probably do all of this. Could you do like a condensed version to, they called it Panda Express. And they went from tinkering with this recipe for a location in Hawaii to developing orange chicken to selling millions of pounds of it per year, being the number one user of broccoli florets in the country and now um the guy the chef himself said that his daughter i think goes to usc they call her the orange chicken princess and i will tell you i will tell you sam from the bottom of my heart it was i i won't curse so your show has a broad appeal but it is the best effing orange chicken i have ever eaten in my life so right now in 2022 I know the show is about the 80s, but what do you think food trends for 2022? What do you think some chain restaurants are going to come up with? That's a really great question. I think obviously with the pandemic and different states having different COVID regulations, I think you're going to start seeing uh, dishes either being made to go. Like remember people started doing pizza kits to take home. I think that you're going to start seeing number one, more places with vegan options, more places with gluten-free options, paleo, so on and so forth. I think you're going to start seeing what used to be considered niche ethnic foods becoming more popular. So I think, you know, the fact that, you know, Red Lobster's Cheddar Bay Biscuits are Brazilian pão de queijo, like cheese bread. So good. That you're f- So good. So good. But like, that's the thing, right? You're finding these little elements sort of dropping in to like our American pop culture, Sriracha, this Southeast Asian hot sauce is now everywhere. So I think we'll start seeing that, but I also think people are going to be wanting to do more grab and go. I mean, mask mandates or not people's comfort level around eating indoors is still not where it was pre pandemic. So I think you're going to start finding a lot of dishes made with an eye towards, um, you know, takeout. I think you're going to start seeing more meal oriented stuff coming from some of the fast food chains because it's safer for just a lot of people that aren't comfortable eating indoors yet. It's true. And I, I like the idea of the DIY kits. That, that's a great idea to keep going because it, it's fun. It's like, a night, you know, you get the food, you go home, you make it with your friends, your family. It, it's, a, it's a good night out. It's a lot of fun. I love it. And yeah. it's a skill set. It's a skill set you acquire. Like, who knows? The little kid who loved eating pizza may find that he or she also liked making it. And that could lead them down a whole path of culinary creativity. It could be a whole path of, of employment that is enlightening to them. So I think that that's uh, a pretty special thing. Adam, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Everybody, you got to watch Adam Eats the 80s on the History Channel. How can you not want to see what goes on in the 80s? It's the 80s!